Good day, everybody. This is Dr. Sanjay Sanyal, Professor Department Chair. So this is going to be a demonstration of the anti-abdominal wall, more specifically the rectus abdominis muscle, the rectus sheath, exactly how it is formed. So this is a supine cadaver. We are standing on the right side. So this structure that we see here, this is the anterior layer of the rectus sheath. Now, what we have done, we have split the anterior layer of rectus sheath and I'm reflecting on the right side, I'm reflecting it. So one side we have lifted and this is the other side that we have lifted. So we have split the anterior layer of rectus sheath. Here we can see one big muscle here. This is the rectus abdominis muscle. So let's talk a few quick words about the rectus abdominis muscle itself. The rectus abdominis muscle is the strongest muscle of the anterior abdominal wall. This is the one which provides the maximum strength, especially we would have noticed boxers develop this muscle because it gives protection. The lateral margin of the rectus abdominis muscle is here and that forms a groove on the anterior abdominal wall which is called the linea semilunaris, which extends from the pubic bone to the tip of the ninth costal cartilage. Coming to the rectus abdominis muscle itself, it takes origin from the pubic crest and the pubic tubercle here where my finger is located. And the fibers, they go up and they diverge. And the fibers, they get inserted to the fifth, sixth and seventh costal cartilages. So this is the full extent of the rectus abdominis muscle. Because it's such a long muscle, it has got what is known as tendinous intersections. And we can see two such tendinous intersections here. We can see one irregular line here. This is one tendinous intersection. And we can see yet another irregular line here. This is a second tendinous intersection. These tendinous intersections allow the rectus abdominis to function as components. Each portion can function as an independent unit. And we can see a little bit, there can be a small tendinous intersection below. The rule of thumb is, you would have heard about six pack abdomen. Well, the six pack abdomen is actually because of these tendinous intersections. These tendinous intersections are the places where it is attached to the skin. Therefore, it produces the so-called pack abdomens. The rule of thumb is the number of tendinous intersection multiplied by two is equal to the pack abdomen. So if there are three tendinous intersections, it's a six pack abdomen. We can have four pack abdomen, we can have eight pack, we can have 10 pack abdomen depending on person to person. So what is the function of this rectus abdominis muscle? As I said, it provides protection. It protects the internal organs and it also helps to flex the trunk. It also, because it's attached to the ribs, it also acts as an accessory muscle of respiration, especially during forced expiration, like for example, a person having emphysema. This is the muscle which is used to do sit-up crunches, which bodybuilders do when they develop this muscle. And this also is an anti-lordotic muscle. That means it opposes the action of the psoas major, which is a lordotic muscle. So this is the rectus abdominis muscle. Now, I shall mention how the rectus sheath is formed. The rectus abdominis muscle is completely enclosed by an anterior tough layer of fascia, which is called anterior rectus sheath. And on the posterior aspect, I'm going to reflect this to show you another fascia. This is called the posterior rectus sheath. How are they formed? The anterior rectus sheath is formed by the fusion of the aponeurosis of the external oblique muscle of the abdomen and the anterior half of the aponeurosis of the internal oblique muscle. And they fuse to form the anterior rectus sheath. And we can see the fibers very clearly here. How about the posterior rectus sheath? The posterior rectus sheath is formed by the posterior half of the fibers of the internal oblique and the fibers of the transversus abdominis aponeurosis. They form the posterior rectus sheath. But here there's a catch. At the junction of the upper three-fourths and the lower one-fourth, there is no posterior rectus sheath in the true sense of the word. So the junction between the upper three-fourths and the lower one-fourth is shown by a faint line here. And that line is called the arcuate line. And it is through that line that the inferior epigastric vessels enter into the rectus sheath. And where are the inferior epigastric vessels? This is the inferior epigastric vessel. This inferior epigastric vessel comes from the external iliac artery and the external iliac vein. And they run on the posterior surface of the rectus abdominis muscle and they go up. They enter into the rectus sheath through the arcuate line. So what is there in the lower one fourth? In the lower one fourth, all the three aponeurosis, the external oblique aponeurosis, the internal oblique aponeurosis, and the transverse ab abdominis aponeurosis, all of them go anteriorly. So therefore, in the lower one-fourth, there is no posterior rectus sheath 
there is only fascia transversalis and there is parietal peritoneum. When we come to the upper portion where the rectus abdominis gets inserted, also there is no posterior rectus sheath because here only the costal cartilages of the fifth, sixth, and seventh ribs are located. That brings me to yet one more point which is visible in our dissection. Just anterior to the rectus, we can see another small muscle here. This is not always visible, but in this dissection, we can clearly see it here. This muscle is called the pyramidalis muscle. This takes origin from the pubic bone and it gets attached to the rectus. And this function of this pyramidalis muscle is to make the linea alba tight when it contracts. There will be one pyramidalis muscle on this side and there is another pyramidalis muscle on that side. Surgeons use this pyramidalis muscle for making a strictly midline incision right through the linea alba. That brings me to what exactly is this linea alba and how is it formed? The word linea alba means a white line. Linea means line, alba means white. This linea alba, if you look very carefully, is a tough sheet and we can see the cut edge here on one side and we can see the cut edge on the other side here. This linea alba is formed by crisscrossing fibers of the external oblique from this side to the external oblique on the other side and vice versa. And it's also formed by the crisscrossing fibers of the internal oblique of this side with the external oblique of that side and vice versa. So the crisscrossing fibers, they cross at the linea alba and they provide this tough white line which is referred to as the linea alba. The clinical significance of this linea alba is we use this to make a midline laparotomy incision during emergencies, like for example, intraperitoneal hemorrhage. Because it gives us very quick access into the abdomen, we can enter the abdomen within seconds. The caveat is when we are repairing this linea alba, we have to use non-absorbable sutures because if we use absorbable sutures, it will give way and it will produce what is known as incisional hernia. So I have demonstrated the formation of the rectus sheath from the right side. Now what we are going to do is, we are going to shift our focus to the left side and I'm going to show you the same rectus sheath and the rectus abdominis muscle and the layers of the abdominal wall from a different perspective. So now we have shifted our focus to the left side of the cadaver. So this is again the same supine cadaver, we are on the left side. And what we have done here, we have made a transverse cut on this side of the abdomen, on the left side. And we have lifted up the two flaps. And that's what we are going to do now. And my assistant is holding it up and she's lifting it up. And we can see very clearly the various layers of the abdominal wall. So let's start off where we had left off in the previous dissection. This is the cut section of the rectus abdominis muscle and we can see that very clearly here. This is the anterior layer of the rectus sheath. And you can see it is thick, and this is the posterior layer of the rectus sheath, which is thin. And I've already described to you how it will form, and we shall see it now. Now let's come further laterally. We can see three layers of abdominal wall muscles. We can see this layer. This is the external oblique muscle, and this is the external oblique aponeurosis. This is the internal oblique muscle. This is the internal oblique aponeurosis, and this is the transverse abdominis muscle, and the transverse abdominis aponeurosis. Now I want you to focus exactly on the rectus sheath itself. We can see that this is the anterior layer of rectus sheath. This is the anterior layer. And how is the anterior layer of rectus sheath formed? It is formed by the aponeurosis of the external oblique and half of the aponeurosis of the internal oblique because the internal oblique aponeurosis is splitting into a Y. So this is the very unique thing which I wanted to show to you. And how is the posterior layer of rectus sheath formed? The posterior layer of rectus sheath is formed again by the posterior leaf of the internal oblique and the transverse abdominis. So we can clearly see the Y-shaped splitting of the internal oblique. This forms the anterior layer of rectus sheath and this forms the posterior layer of rectus sheath and in between is the rectus abdominis muscle. Now we shall shift our focus to the upper half of the cut section and we will show precisely the same thing. So we are going to lift and keep this aside. And now I'm lifting the upper half. And once we lift up the upper half, we can see the same thing. Now my assistant is holding up the upper half and we can see this is the posterior layer of rectus sheath. This is the anterior layer of rectus sheath. And in between is the rectus abdominis muscle, the cut section. This is the linea semilunaris which I mentioned on the other side. That means the lateral margin of the rectus abdominis. And down below, laterally, we can see these three layers of the abdominal wall. This innermost is the transverse abdominis muscle. 
This middle one is the internal oblique and the outer one is the external oblique. And again, we can see when we trace it medially, we can see that the anterior layer of rectus sheath is formed by the external oblique aponeurosis and by the anterior leaf of the internal oblique. And we can see the internal oblique is splitting here also and we can see the Y more clearly. And the posterior layer of rectus sheath is formed by the transversus abdominis and the posterior leaf of the internal oblique. So therefore, this dissection clearly shows the formation of the rectus sheath. So that brings me to some clinical and functional significance of this rectus sheath. In this particular dissection on this side, we can clearly see that the lower margin of the rectus sheath is finishing here, the posterior layer of the rectus sheath. This is the arcuate line that I mentioned a little while back. And below that, there is no rectus sheath. We can see that there is no rectus sheath below that. It is through this opening, this arcuate line, we can see the inferior epigastric vessels entering. We can see this. This is the inferior epigastric vessels. Inferior epigastric vessel comes from the external iliac artery and it enters into the posterior wall of the rectus sheath. And we can see it is entering into the posterior layer of the rectus abdominis muscle. This inferior epigastric artery and the vein, they go up like this. And we can see it on the other side. They are going up on the inner surface of the rectus abdominis muscle. And coming from the top will be an opposing artery and vein that's called the superior epigastric artery and vein. And they will form an anastomosis. The inferior epigastric vein communicates with the superior epigastric vein. And this is a site of superior vena cava and inferior vena cava communication. What is the significance of that? It means the blood from the inferior epigastric vein can drain into the inferior vena cava. The blood from the superior epigastric vein will drain into the internal thoracic vein in the chest. And from there, it will drain into the brachiocephalic vein. And from there, it will drain into the superior vena cava. In patients who have an obstruction of the inferior vena cava, like for example, a liver cancer, the blood will then channelize itself in the opposite direction. And it will flow through the inferior epigastric vein superior epigastric vein and it will flow into the superior vena cava. So that is the clinical and the functional significance of this communication between the superior epigastric and the inferior epigastric. The next significance is, as I was talking about laparotomy on that side, we can do a laparotomy through a paramedian incision also. We can make an incision through the anterior layer of the rectus sheath. That is more time consuming, but it gives more protection. And we reflect the anterior layer of rectus sheath as shown here and the other side we reflect like this and then we retract the rectus abdominis muscle laterally why do we retract it laterally i will show you just now and then we cut the posterior layer of rectus sheath and we can enter into the abdomen so that is called a paramedian incision the reason why we retract the rectus abdominis muscle laterally is because the neurovascular structures to the rectus abdominis they come from the thoracoabdominal nerves they come from lateral to medial and on this side we can see the neurovascular structures clearly here and I'm going to pick up a few of them. We can see one vessel here. We can see another one here. We can see another one here and we can see some more here. So these are all the neurovascular structures which are coming to the rectus abdominis muscle in a segmental fashion from lateral to medial and they supply the rectus abdominis muscle from the lateral aspect. That's the reason why we retract the rectus abdominis laterally to prevent injury to the neurovascular structures. That is also another important point because the rectus abdominis gets segmental supply from T7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Even if we cut the rectus abdominis muscle, still it can function because each segment receives its own individual nerve supply. It can function as a separate unit. So these are the points which I want to mention about the rectus sheath, rectus abdominis muscle, the linea alba, and exactly how the rectus sheath is formed. Thank you very much for watching. Sepp is the camera person. Elisha is the person who assisted me. If you have any questions or comments, please put them in the comment section below. Dr. Sanjay Sanya signing out. Please like and subscribe. Have a nice day.